Good afternoon, and welcome to this very special inaugural lecture for Doors Open Baltimore, presented by Baltimore Architectural Foundation and Baltimore Heritage. I am Sarsfield Williams, Jr., board member of the Baltimore Architectural Foundation, and it is my pleasure to be joining you here from the Baltimore Center for Architectural Design with Dr. Lawrence Brown. First, thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support enables us to organize programs like Doors Open Baltimore for free each year. And thank you to those of you who ordered copies of Dr. Brown's book. Signed copies are now ready to go out for delivery. And those of you who ordered copies for pickup can now make an appointment at the Baltimore Center for Architecture and Design. And a big thank you to this year's Doors Open Baltimore sponsors and Baltimore Architectural Foundation supporters. Now for just a few announcements. This program kicks off a month of free Doors Open Baltimore programs, both in-person and virtual. It is also the opening day of the Say It Loud Maryland exhibition here at the center. Our first major exhibition here celebrates the profound achievements of Maryland's diverse designers and is currently open by appointment. There are so many great programs to choose from this year. If you enjoy Dr. Brown's presentation today, I recommend you tune in on October 13th for a virtual presentation about East Towson, a historic African-American community unique to Baltimore County and our nation. And on October 29th, please join us for a presentation about Poppleton and the efforts to preserve and document this African-American neighborhood and the advocacy efforts to fight displacement. And now for today's featured presentation. Dr. Lawrence Brown is an equity scientist, urban Afrofuturist, and the director of the Baltimore Butterfly Academy a virtual racial equity education and consulting firm. From 2013 to 2019, he served as an assistant and associate professor at Morgan State University in the School of Community Health and Policy. In June of 2018, he was honored by OSI Baltimore with the Bold Thinker Award for sparking critical discourse regarding Baltimore's racial segregation. In 2020, he directed the US COVID Atlas work and response for the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Program in partnership with the University of Chicago Center for Spatial Data and Science. His first book, The Black Butterfly, The Harmful Politics of Race and Space in America, was published by the Johns Hopkins University Press in January of this year. After Dr. Brown's presentation, moderator Elizabeth Evitz Dickinson will lead us in a Q&A dis with discussants, Dr. Seema Iyer, Mr. Tom Leibel, and award-winning architect, Nikita Reed. If you have questions for Dr. Brown during his lecture, please add them to the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to present to you, Dr. Lawrence Brown. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to all for being here today. We're excited to have you here, uh, coming live from the headquarters <laughs> here of the Baltimore uh, Architectural Foundation. And I want to, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you today, knowing that I'm speaking mostly to an audience of architects. I want you to think about the architecture of a city, not just the buildings, but the way that history has built a certain architecture for Baltimore City uh, in particular. And if you're joining us from around the country, then certainly I hope that uh, this illuminates this particular history can illuminate some things uh, that are actually not very uh, particular, but quite universal. And I'm even told that we have folks from 
across the pond uh, joining us. And so welcome if you're coming, uh, joining us virtually from overseas. So I wanna talk to you today, Baltimore apartheid and the building community. Uh, and I want us to delve into quite a bit of history and then we'll arrive hopefully at a place where we can have some really wonderful solutions. And I want to also say that when you're going to visit, if you're able to go and visit these sites for Doors Open Baltimore in person, I want you to keep in mind much of this history that we're gonna to discuss today. So as we move forward on the next slide, I wanna share uh, some scholarship that I think is really important for folks to be reading uh, that really illuminates how American apartheid works in America. And so be sure that your library is stocked full with these books like these. So the next slide, we're gonna sort of take a trip back in time. If you're in Baltimore, uh, it's amazing. I just found this out two months ago that Baltimore has a plantation that still exists, still standing in the Carroll Park community, uh, in the Mount Clare community in Carroll Park. Um, so the, the way that this is really just fascinating, we actually had a rededication, a reframing ceremony for uh, this plantation to really sort of say that we're gonna use this as a institution that will educate. And what I thought was really uh, interesting about this is first of all, it was built in 1760. You can see the slave owners, slave masters there, Charles Carroll, the barrister, because there were multiple Charles Carrolls. So he distinguished himself by referring to himself as the barrister and then his wife, Margaret Tillman. And so, I mean, I love history. So it was really interesting to see this plantation edifice this mansion up close. It was amazing to see. But one thing I want you to think about is how racism in America, apartheid in America, is not just about the domination of people. Slavery was more than just the domination of people. Slavery was also about the domination of space. And I want you to think, where did the enslaved people live? Where were their quarters? What did they look like? Why doesn't it still exist? The mansion still exists, but we don't see the slave quarters. We don't see, they were of course likely to be much smaller, maybe made of wood, maybe made of substances that weren't gonna last and stand the test of time. And so this really allows us to focus at the beginning on the fact that architecture and the way that space is laid out it contributes to the way that architecture and the thinking around space operates in Baltimore City. So even before Baltimore was a city, Baltimore was practicing slavery and allowing you, there was also this contribution or this manifestation of how slavery was also about the domination of space. So the next slide I wanna highlight that African-Americans fought back and organized and built beautiful institutions, buildings like these. Um, even though this building was built in 1882, this Orchard Street Church was in existence before this building here was, was uh, actually designed and built. And so this is also in West Baltimore, beautiful church, I've been here before. And it's amazing, it's, it feels amazing to have an institution, a building like this, the church, which is often so pivotal in African-American communities to have this building still standing and it's still being used today by the Greater Baltimore Urban League. So it's not just a relic, it's actually, and I'm actually told that it was a spot, uh, a location where the Underground Railroad uh, was actually uh, in operation. There are tunnels beneath the building of this church. So, even though there's the plantation, which was again about the domination of space, not just the domination of people, we also have these type of buildings and architects can build these type of buildings that are buildings for liberation as opposed to domination. So I want us to keep that in mind. On the next slide, oh wait, why am I saying that? 
<laughs> no wonder he's looking. <laughs> I have my own clicker. <laughs> ah, I forgot I had it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's work. Oh, I didn't turn it on. All right. I'm sorry. I got it. Nathan has supplied me with my own clicker. <laughs> and I've just figured it out. All right. So here we are. I don't have to keep saying next slide. So I want us to think about the role of the media. And here we have the Baltimore Sun. And look at the language. Oh my goodness, look at the language. Look at how on the top left, the Baltimore Sun, 1838, wanted to purchase a female house servant and a boy and a girl from 10 to 12 years of age, would prefer a woman and two children of the, that age. They must be slaves for life. Apply at the office of the Sun. I mean, like this is really amazing that the way that the main media institution in the history of this city was publishing these type of advertisements and was serving as a space for the slave trade to take place. So keep in mind that this is the type of media news outlet that we have historically in Baltimore City. Then of course, in the middle, you can see Negroes wanted, cash for Negroes. You can see the slave traders, Hope H. Slater, Joseph S. Donovan, William Harker, you can see where they were located, particularly at the bottom, North 2 South Calvert, or number two South Calvert Street. So all of this is happening in Baltimore. That's from 1843 and then 1849 on the right. Again, Hope H. Slater, he was a major, major. Actually in this one, he's selling, he sold his slave jail. He sold his operation to the Campbells and he's saying, hey, I'm retired. I want you to trust these guys with your Negro slaves. So this was all taking place near and around the Inner Harbor, not just slavery, but the slave trade. So this is part of the architecture of Baltimore. Where are those buildings? Where are these, where are these, uh, the, where's the commemoration of this activity down in this area that's very commercial now? Where are we commemorating? Where are we honoring the way that African-Americans were being bought and sold and bartered and put on ships at the harbor, at the wharves and the docks? Where are we honoring? Where are the monuments? This map was constructed by a, a black man named Paul Rucker and he did temporary light installations, which were wonderful, but we need something much more permanent to commemorate this. And you can read more about this in Ralph Clayton's book. So I'm, I want you to think about, so we've talked about the plantation, slavery, the slave trade. Now let's talk about systems. How did systems operate in Baltimore? Um, in Baltimore, before there was racial segregation in public education, there was complete exclusion. Black children were not allowed because Baltimore had a fairly large free black community throughout slavery, but they were not allowed to enroll in Baltimore City Public Schools. Then when they were allowed, those schools were racially segregated. They were called colored schools. Black, back then, black people were often called colored or Negro. Then after the age of desegregation, Baltimore City Public Schools enacted a program of controlled desegregation, which was met by white resistance. And then finally, we're in a period now of deep underfunding because Baltimore in the state of Maryland has a per pupil funding formula. So as people leave the city, the funding leaves with them. And so this is the architecture of apartheid in our public school system. But again, African-Americans, Black people were always fighting back. On the left, you see the Stewart sisters. These sisters in the 1880s, they purchased a first class ticket on a steamboat called the Sioux. And they were like, all right, now we're going to be all, we're going to have a good trip. And, but when they got on the boat, oh my goodness, they were placed at the bottom as opposed to on the top. And they were down there with the filthy animals, the hogs and the chickens and all the animals and they were being segregated and not allowed to 
partake in their first class accommodations. So we saw that in the 1880s, transportation began to be racially segregated. But they fought back, they sued, and I believe they actually won. But rail cars, other forms of transportation would become segregated down the line. Then you had these black men here. They were part of an organization called the Mutual Brotherhood of Liberty. And they fought back, they helped push for the desegregation of schools, for black teachers to teach black children in Baltimore City Public Schools. Reverend Harvey Johnson is in the middle of that picture. Directly beneath him is another black lawyer named William Ashby Hawkins. And I believe to his left, that looks, it, I believe that's a young W.E.B. Du Bois uh, in this picture as well. So black Baltimoreans were pushing back against the architecture of racial segregation. But white mayors, they just kept going. They, racism was not to be denied. So here we have four mayors that I call the godfathers of Baltimore apartheid. We're gonna talk about all of them. Uh, three of the most, we'll talk about them. Uh, but John Barry Mahul, James Preston, William Browning, and Howard Jackson. So here's the man. It's always the man in the middle. You ever notice that it's the man in the middle? So look at the man in the middle, the New York Times article. That is Baltimore Mayor John Barry Mahul in 1910. 1910, the New York Times is on the scene and they capture, they capture the evidence of Baltimore passing the first residential racial zoning ordinance in American history. Baltimore leads the way. Baltimore is the prototype. Baltimore is ground zero for urban apartheid in America. And you should pull this article up. You can, you can download it for free. It is um, the most fascinating article I think I've run across in my research. And you can see the evidence in the middle when this black man to the left of the mayor, George McMechan and his wife, Anna, and their two children, they moved into this all white block and they did what black people do. They say, yes, we can. Hi, we moving on up. We finally got a piece of the pie. But the white community said, oh, no, you Negroes can't. So you can see right there in the middle, look at the holes that are in the window. You can see that the white community picked up rocks and they threw it through their window, picked up bricks, threw it through the skylight of the home. I'm not even sure if this house is on the doors open Baltimore list, but it's still there. It's right there in West Baltimore. This is where urban apartheid, that 1836 McCullough Street. Actually, there should be a plaque. That should, there should be some way of commemorating that this legacy, this started in West Baltimore. And so we come back. Now my field, public health, they're playing a role. These articles, especially the one on the left and the one in the middle, well, and even the third one as well, they're showing that the use of statistics, public health data are being used because the mayor has asked the Baltimore City Health Department. So now we have another system involved, health, public health. So now the mayor is asking them for data and they're using data to say, hey, black people are dying more from tuberculosis. These Negroes, they're dying more, they higher death rate. And you can see at the bottom of the first article, it is understood that the mayor, now the mayor is James Preston, that the mayor will announce a plan of partial segregation for Negroes. But more than that, the next sentence, a section of the county may be laid out along modern lines as a Negro colony. So not only is Mayor James Preston planning to segregate Negroes, he's planning to uproot several hundred black families and move them out to the county. And that's what you see in the middle slide, suburban colony proposed. So this is Mayor James Preston. He is helping to, he follows his predecessor and now he is 
enforcing racial segregation and proposing a Negro colony displacement. So that's Mayor James Preston. I write a lot more about him in my book, if you want to know more. And so now we got to come back. We got to come back and talk about the Baltimore Sun. We got to talk about the Baltimore Sun. Look at this language. I showed this earlier on the left. Cash for Negroes. The commodification of Black life. In the middle article, look at this racist language. Negro domination. And then the last article, Negro invasion. This is the Baltimore Sun using this language. I was logged on to newspaper.com, y'all. And I saw that at the bottom they had the number of times that certain, whatever I put in the search field, the number of times that certain phrases were being used, whatever was in the search field. So I said, what about, let me try this out. And so I found out the Sun used cash for Negroes 795 times. Negro domination 525 times. Negro invasion 276 times. Almost 1,600 times. And then I look, you can look at the bottom left of the screenshot I took, the Baltimore Sun was number one. It was number one in all three categories. So I feel safe in saying that Statistically and quantitatively speaking, the Baltimore Sun is the most racist paper in American history. So think about what type of narratives come out of this media outlet. And how do narratives shape policies, practices, systems, and budgets? Because whatever you believe is the narrative, then you're gonna structure, you're gonna design, you're gonna plan, you're gonna build your city according to the dominant narratives. And the Baltimore Sun was putting these type of narratives out into the general population. So this is part of the architecture of the city, the narratives, the media narratives that help structure the physical, social reality of Baltimore City. Then we arrive in the 30s. Now the federal government gets involved. They create the Homeowners Loan Corporation and its cousin, the Federal Housing Administration. They got together later on, but they drew this map, the most devastating map, perhaps in Baltimore history. And this map concretizes, solidifies urban apartheid and its economic devastation in Black communities while simultaneously advantaging structurally those white neighborhoods that are in green and blue. The yellow communities were often for you were European immigrants who had recently arrived, or not so recently by this time, because America cut off immigration leading up to World War II. But before they cut off immigration, you had a lot of people from Italy, from Ireland, from Poland, from these European countries. So these immigrants, they were trying to get out of Europe because they were like, man, it's too much violence. We already had one world war and it looks like they about to start another one. We got the go and they came to America. And they were discriminated against as well. But in those red communities were African-Americans, urban Native Americans. And if you know anything about this map, you know that this map determined which communities received access to capital, which communities the banks would lend to and which communities they would deny lending to. And we can see, well, you can say, Dr. Brown, that was a long time ago. Well, let's look at this Zillow data over here, the data produced by this real estate entity. And you can see here that 80 years later, the homes that are in the red colored communities are still beneath and below the values 
of the yellow, green, and blue communities. And if you look at the beginning of that period, it was about a $50,000 gap between the bottom and the top. And now the gap is about doubled over the 20 year period. So it's getting worse. Now there's a scholar named Noliwe Rooks who wrote a book called Cutting School. And she coined a term called segnomics. Segnomics I define in my book is the economic weaponization of racial segregation. If you're taking notes, you ought to write that down right quick. Segnomics is the economic weaponization of racial segregation and this map helped kickstart and concretize and make segronomics a powerful reality, determining the future of neighborhoods, the architecture of communities, the architecture of the city. But this map was drawn in over 200 cities across America. So this is a fully nationwide story. And Baltimore is at the heart of it, but Baltimore is not unique. We see that this segronomics, this map that weaponized racial segregation economically was created, especially in those cities, even in the North. A lot of times we like to tell a story of, of America being racist in the South. Look at all those dots up North because these are the cities where many African-Americans were leaving the deep South after 1910 because of lynchings, because of the destruction of black communities and black economic districts like the Greenwood community in Tulsa, 1921, Rosewood community down in Florida, 1923. This white supremacist violence destroyed wealthy black communities and wealthy and the attempts at economic organizing, like in Elaine, Arkansas, when a group of black farmers organized in 1919 to try to start a farmer's union, and then they were slaughtered. They were slaughtered in the church, in the church where they were meeting. So because of this tremendous racist violence, many black people fled the South but they were greeted in the North with this residential racial segregation, American apartheid regime. Well, now we gotta move on. Let's talk about public housing, Pu public housing. And yet another system, another system. Now we arrive in the forties and we can go, these maps are in 20 year increments, 40, 60, 80, 2000. So what I want you to see here is how public housing engages in double segregation. This architecture, and we don't think about architecture in public housing, but picture of public housing is a huge part of the story. So here, look at the dots. The dots represent public housing communities. And the darker the gray, on the legend on the left, it represents census tracts that had more African-Americans. And we can see where was public housing placed in the 40s, the 60s, the 80s, and 2000. Public housing was placed in and around Black. So y'all ever heard that term, concentrated poverty? Anybody ever heard that term? I hate the term concentrated poverty. Dr. Brown, why do you hate the term concentrated poverty? I tell you, because concentrated poverty does not tell us how poverty became concentrated. It doesn't tell us who concentrated the poverty. If you just heard the term concentrated poverty, you might be thinking that poor people just randomly decide to get together and be poor. Come on, y'all, let's be poor. Where are we going to be poor? I don't know. Let's randomly pick a place and go be poor. As if this all just happened, oops, by accident. It's poor people just random. Come on, let's go be randomly poor over there. No, 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 no. Let's go randomly be poor. That is not what happened. Look at the map. 
public housing, this system concentrated poverty in black neighborhoods. The architecture of poverty is illustrated. And as more African-Americans moved into the city, more and more public housing was placed in the, do y'all see any public housing up in Northwest Baltimore where you got the Mount Washington community, you got Roland Park, Guilford, Homeland, Laurelville on the Northeast side. I don't see one public housing unit up in those white communities. It's all concentrated in black neighborhoods. Even in the age of desegregation, Mm. After 1968, the Fair Housing Act. Even then, look at those yellow dots. They represent scatter sites. The architects of public housing finally figured out it's it's a bad idea to build big towers and then concentrate low-income people in them. So they say we gotta build flatter and we gotta spread it out. But even when they did that, look at the scatter sites and where they are placed intentionally placed in black neighborhoods. I forgot to tell you about the other kind of segregation. Back in 1940, the public housing units were racially segregated. Who could live in each community? Those projects, I don't like that language, but that's what's on, the, on here. Those communities, the public housing communities were racially segregated as well. So who, the people that could live in certain communities that was segregated, and then where they were placed, placed, excuse me, was also in black neighborhoods. So that's double racial segregation. But again, black activists always pushing back, always fighting back. Here, this is a flyer from the lead organization, Congress of Racial Equality. Core, so Baltimore Core, they're following up on the March on Washington and they're marching against segregated housing in Baltimore in 1965. Then you had 71, an organization called Activists Incorporated, Activists for Fair Housing, and they wrote a report talking about the phenomenon of blockbusters. And these were white men and they're all white men right here in this column who sold, who, who scared white people out of their homes using racist uh, fear. And so when the white homeowners left, they sold their home at a very low rate because they're trying to get out of Dodge. They don't have time to sell high. They trying to go. So they're like, I, let me just get rid of this house. So on the third to last column, that's the average price of the house when it was bought by the, the speculator, the blockbuster. And then the second to last column is the, is the price that African-Americans had to pay in order to buy those homes because now the housing market was opening up. Before this, black people were concentrated, remember, concentrated in poverty. So now middle, middle income African-Americans, they're able to buy homes but look at that markup. Look at how much black wealth is being decimated because these speculators, today we might call this uh, subprime lending. <laughs> these speculators, they were selling to African-Americans at exorbitant prices. And here's an activist at the bottom, Walter Percival Carter, Carter some called him the Dr. King of Maryland. He was helping, he was a part of Activist Inc. You can see he was also a part of CORE at the bottom of that flyer. He helped push to help desegregate Baltimore, uh, a tremendous activist. But again, white supremacy, the architecture of white supremacy was relentless. Now we have, we're in the 50s. And this, did y'all know that this is a, this is our Speaker of the House's father. This is a Nancy Pelosi's father, Mayor Thomas D. Alessandro Jr. And we, we like Nancy Pelosi, she's doing a good job. But unfortunately, her father, 
He was over presiding over urban renewal. And this was a federal policy joined by the city government. So urban renewal was a policy that started with the Housing Act of 1949. And then it was made even stronger with the Housing Act of 1954. Because then universities and hospitals, they could participate in the uprooting of people. And they were trying to redevelop, as you can see in the map on the right, they were trying to redevelop the blighted areas in, across America, often around downtown. So you can see this map of urban renewal projects in Baltimore. And from the outset, African Americans were opposed to the way that urban renewal was being conducted. Here you see the Baltimore Urban League, the Maryland NAACP, which was led by Dr. Lily Mae Carroll Jackson. They are opposing the way that this urban renewal scheme, which the writer James Baldwin called Negro removal, they're opposing the way that urban renewal actually helps to strengthen racial segregation. Well, what do you mean, Dr. Brown? It's right there in the first sentence of the letter by the NAACP. The Baltimore, Maryland slum clearance and redevelopment program deprives colored people of living space and places the full strength of the federal government behind a policy of rigid residential segregation in that city. They saw this, all this, at the outset. they saw that urban renewal was going to strengthen urban apartheid. It was going to make it even worse. Well, now we got to talk about how this all happened. We got to talk about plant. You know, we got some plant designers in the room today. So we got to talk about how planning was lily, lily, lily white. Look at the planning commission from this urban renewal book that is in the Enoch Pratt Central Library. All white men, all white men are on the planning commission right here. And then even 50, 60, 70 years later, when Baltimore was advocate or looking at the Sagamore TIF tax increment financing recommendation that the Sagamore TIF asked 11 key informants to talk about how good this would be. And all 11 of these key informants were white men. So the whiteness of planning helps us to understand how urban renewal, how public housing, how everything that we've seen was done in a way that led to the decimation, the degradation of black neighborhoods. And the impact was tremendous. We have this data from the Department of Housing, and community development, yet another system in Baltimore, because their predecessor was BRHA, the Baltimore Urban Renewal and Housing Agency. And they document that 16,505 households were uprooted between 1951 and 1971. And the vast majority, relocation, you can see there right below the numbers, relocation affects far more non-white than white households. This, so urban renewal had a devastating impact on black families and black neighborhoods. Uprooted, just like Mayor James Preston, he uprooted black people in a community called Gallows Hill, which is across a Mercy Hospital. And now today it's a, there's a garden there called Preston's Gardens. So he helped pioneer, that wasn't the first time, but he helped pioneer racial segregation and displacement. And look at how urban renewal took it to a whole nother level. Thousands, because how many people lived in each of those households? That's households, that's not the people. That's the number of houses, the households. So y'all know how big families were back then? Anybody know how big families were back then? How many? Uh, how many siblings your parents had, <laughs> right? Four or five, let's be conservative and go with five, right? 
because a lot of black families had a whole lot more than that. So multiply that times five, we're talking about 80, 85, perhaps 100,000 people. Perhaps 100,000 people uprooted over a 20 year period in Baltimore City. And this happened all across America. Black neighborhoods uprooted. Even as black people were gaining political rights, 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act, 1968 Fair Housing Act, even as black people are gaining political rights, black neighborhoods are being uprooted and dis decimated. And this map here, show, I've tried to annotate, <laughs> excuse my colorful annotation, but I annotate the number of households in West Baltimore, University of Maryland displaces. Look at Camden Industrial Park, 846 households. Mount Vernon, 210 households. As far north as Waverly, 207 households. Johns Hopkins, 1,335 households. Massive displacement in the center of the city, which is where many African-Americans lived in this period of time. Also, I included highway displacement. I-83, 260 households. The US-40, Highway to Nowhere, 965 households. And then in this yellow bottom portion of the map, I'm highlighting that when Hope 6 came, this is a federal policy under President Bill Clinton, which was involved in the demolition of lots of public housing. And so you can see the yellow circles in the middle of the city where many public housing communities would be demolished 30 or so years after urban renewal. So over and over, Black neighborhoods, Black people were being uprooted and displaced. And my predecessor over at the mighty Morgan State University, Dr. Homer Favor, he saw it all. He saw it coming. In the Afro-American, he said, it seems to me that the city has indicated it will attempt to solve the problems by bringing in middle class and upper middle class privilege, basically whites, and dislocating the blacks who are here and then viewing this transformation as a major accomplishment. He was already talking about the G word, gentrification. <laughs> he was already talking about it back in 1978, a month before I was born. He was showing how the architecture of urban renewal was getting ready to reshape Baltimore City. And so this is where we are today. Baltimore is a category five hyper-segregated city. And I'm using the terminology of sociologist Douglas Massey and his colleague Nancy Denton that they developed and published in their book called American Apartheid back in the 90s. And so you can see here this racial dot map, which was created by Dustin Cable, who was then at the University of Virginia. And you can see here at the legend on the bottom right, blue represents white, green represents black, red represents Asian, uh, orange represents Hispanic, Latino, Latino, Latinx, brown is other race, Native American. And you can see the racial geography of Baltimore today based on the policies that I've shown you in this presentation. How did Baltimore get to be the city that it is today? Because of that history that I shared with you. And you can see the pattern that serves as the namesake of my book. You see the white L, the black butterfly, what I call the Asian archipelago and the Latino Latina Lagoon. And we even have a Native American enclave in Upper Fells Point with Lumbee tribe, Native Americans who live in Baltimore City. But this is the hyper-segregated reality of Baltimore. And there are eight cities in America, eight cities that are ranked as category five cities in America. And I use category five because the analogy with the hurricane was just too good to pass up. So category five, we know from a hurricane is the most devastating, the most destructive hurricane that we can measure that we have in our scale. And I think the analogy fits with segregation. We're in the most destructive 
form and category of racial segregation in Baltimore City. It makes sense because Baltimore City was the city that created, that pioneered, that engineered, that designed, that planned urban apartheid. So of course we're in the, we're in the top category because we helped put it into place. And we have the most racist newspaper, quantitatively, statistically the most racist newspaper in American history. So if you're trying to understand the architecture of Baltimore, this history helps explain it. And this map reveals it. I forgot to tell you about the other seven cities that are also hyper segregated. You might know them, Chicago, Flint, Detroit, Birmingham, Cleveland, St. Louis, and then our friend Milwaukee. We are in the category of the most destructive category of segregation that we have in America, those eight cities. And we know the problems in those cities, do we not? In fact, if we look at violence, murder, homicide statistics, back in 2017, St. Louis was number one per capita. Baltimore, number two. Memphis, number three. Chicago, number four. Detroit, number five. So four out of the five top cities in homicides are in this category five hypersegregated category. So this tells us that there's something very destructive about hypersegregation that leads to violence and perhaps the segronomics that I discussed, the economic weaponization of racial segregation, the redlining, subpriming, marginalizing, and demonizing of black communities has a lot to do with it. And you might say, well, Dr. Brown, that was all so long ago, but the evidence says that the redlining is still going on. Black neighborhoods are still being deprived of capital. Look at the two maps on the top by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. The green areas represent where African-Americans live. Those dots represent lending. The bigger the dot, the bigger the loans, the bigger the more the lending. And whether you look at home purchases or small business lending, you can see that the lending is concentrated in that white L. Not a whole lot going on in the black butterfly. And that is looking at lending from 2011 to 2013. So this was just in the past decade. Then the Urban Institute, they did an analysis and they looked at residential, commercial and industrial real estate sales per household and I'll be doggone if that pattern is almost a perfect L, showing that that's where the volume of sales is concentrated in Baltimore City between 2011 and 2016. Then we had the Baltimore Business Journal. Oh my goodness, they followed up and they were looking at PPP loans from last year, the Payment Protection Program, to help America recover from COVID. And they did an analysis comparing the PPP program between the white L and the black butterfly. And lo and behold, they also show that the program to help America recover most of those loans, which can be turned into grants are also concentrated in that white L. So the redlining, the segronomics of racial segregation is still taking place, still destroying, still decimating, still undermining black neighborhoods while enriching, oh my goodness, it's enriching, it's advantaging, it's lavishing capital on the already privileged and well-to-do. The people that got money, they get more money, more money. And the data and the maps show this conclusively. And so this is the culmination of the work in my book. This history I use to help explain how America destroys 
and defunds black neighborhoods. This is the architecture of reality in Baltimore City that we created a, we, cre we have multiple systems that help to segregate, then defund, and then uproot over African Americans over and over and over and over again. And this horizontal bars, they represent the communal bonds. And you will note that paradoxically, communal bonds in Black communities and in Black spaces was actually stronger. The longer the bars, the more the strength. Even under slavery, there was more communal strength because this uprooting, this repeated uprootings, these repeated uprootings, they help destroy those communal bonds because it's happening over and over and over again. So it moves the community from a more of a position of solidarity to a state of root shock. If you read Mindy Fully Love, Minnie Thompson Fully Love, her book, she's at Columbia University. And what does this do? The destruction of black neighborhoods, Baltimore's and America's destruction of black neighborhoods, it leads to a loss of connectedness and cooperative work. You can see today, it's not that the bonds are gone. There's still resilience. There's still strength. There's still people making a way out of no way, but this repeated uprooting, repeated segronomics, all of that has led to tremendous devastation in black neighborhoods. So with all of this said, what is the responsibility of the building community? And I'm not just talking about architects. I know I'm talking to architects, planners, designers, construction workers, landscapers, everybody, 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 everybody that's trying to build a future for tomorrow. What is the responsibility given this history? How do we restore joy in America's sorted out cities? How do we embrace culture and build urban communities? This is the task before us to understand the architecture and to understand how it all came to be, who built it, how they did it, what they were thinking so that we can build a better and design and plan a better tomorrow. That's what this is all about as, you, as this Baltimore chapter is celebrating 150 years. What a great, I love history. So that's just, that's just 150 years is just an amazing time frame. But what have you done in 150 years? How have you contributed to the hypersegregated reality that pervades life in Baltimore City? And Furthermore, what are you gonna do? See, I don't, I don't like when people do all the talking. I'm a, even myself, I wanna see action. I wanna know what are people gonna do about this history? And so I know I already hear people talking and thinking in their minds, well, you know, we gotta be incremental. We can't do nothing radical. Okay, well, let's look at what the newspaper was saying back when it all started. So we're going back to the New York Times, back to 1910. We're traveling back in time once again. And I want you to know, I have highlighted or put a rectangle around the first paragraph at the bottom left. And so that's what I've zoomed in on. And in this one, two, three, third paragraph from the bottom of this picture that is on the right, I want you to see what the writer is saying there in 1910. The writer says, attention is called to these facts, not to criticize the ordinance, but solely for the purpose of showing how radical and far reaching it is. So in other words, the writer is saying this ordinance is radical. I mean, yeah, we've had racial segregation in transportation, we've had it in education, you know, we've had it in movie theaters. You know, we've had racial segregation before, but this thing right here, this is radical and far reaching. But then the, art, the, the writer goes on. 
its merits lie wholly within the courts and it may be withheld wholly meritorious. But that is wholly radical for better or worse, but that it is wholly radical for better or worse is evidence from the one deduction above out of many that could be made therefrom. That such a radical measure must have had its inception in radical facts is therefore a certain conclusion. In other words, th this writer mentions that this segregation ordinance is so radical, it mentions it four times. This man, this thing is, I'm trying to wrap, the writer's like, I'm trying to wrap my head around just how, we, we were living side by side. Black and white people didn't have much problem, but we are creating an ordinance. Man, this thing is radical. I can't get over it. I got to repeat myself. This is wholly radical. It is a radical measure, and it has its inception in radical facts. So even in real time, it was understood that racial segregation, that imposing racial segregation was radical. We, and we, we, this is the newspaper saying, we know this, I, this is radical, y'all. I don't know what, I ain't never seen nothing this racist. This takes the cake, what Baltimore is doing. It's really, 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 really radical. Then the Baltimore Municipal Journal from August 10th, 1917. This journal is at the Sheridan Libraries at Johns Hopkins. Awesome resource. But look at the bottom of the first paragraph. I mean, the first column, one of the radical measures, which would seem to be advisable in dealing with this situation, look at all those health statistics, public health, being used to say that it's black people that got the tuberculosis. We, gee, we gotta do something. So what we're gonna do is just have a radical measure to help deal with this situation. And that measure is the elimination of certain congested sections populated by Negroes in which has been noted a very high percentage of deaths from this and other communicable diseases. So notice how the data, first of all, is being weaponized to justify racial segregation. But beyond this, uprooting people, they understood that it was radical. So what, Dr. Brown, what are you trying to say? Get to the point. The point I'm trying to make is this, that if they understood in real time that what we're doing, uprooting black people, segregating Negroes is radical, then what do you think the solution has to be? Don't come at me with no incremental, uh, we got a billion dollar problem and you come at me with a hundred thousand dollar solution. The scale of the solution has to match the scale of the problem. If it was radical back then, then our solutions have to be radical. And that's why I propose a $3 billion racial equity social impact bond to kickstart racial equity in Baltimore City. And half of that is just getting rid of toxic lead. You see that on the right. Because our babies are being poisoned right after birth and sometimes in utero, which is affecting cognitive capacity which then affects emotional regulation, which then affects propensity to violence. When you talk about aggressivity, impulsivity, which then contributes to that school to prison pipeline. It really should be a red line black neighborhood to toxic lead exposure to school to prison pipeline. That's actually the pipeline. And then the other half is violence prevention, eliminating transit, biking and food apartheid, funding for substance abuse treatment, social work and counseling, and then 500 million for community-driven redevelopment. Radical, the problem was radical, the solution must be radical. We got the models, the people, the scholars, the architects, black architects and designers and planners in, out of New York City and other places now, they've created this black space, beautiful black space manifesto. Anybody that's doing development, planning, design, this is it. You can also look at many types of full of love. I like her thing too, but between these two, we got the models. They lay it out right here. Plan with, design with. Center lived experience. Celebrate, catalyze, and amplify black joy. Manifest the future. 
I love that one. I'm an urban Afrofuturist. So we got to we got to make Wakanda real in our red line black communities. Just because we're making black neighborhoods matter don't mean they have to look like white neighborhoods. I guess my time is up. So I just want to say there's a whole suite of solutions. And I'm going to leave you with this. I'm ready to hear this panel that we cannot make Black Lives Matter if we don't make Black neighborhoods matter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much for your commitment to our community, your commitment to our future and your commitment to our elders and our children. It's been stated by James Baldwin that the highest purpose of education is to uplift others. And I thank you for your demonstration of that excellence. And I appreciate the way in which you have challenged this institution to be at the very forefront of creating a better future in a radical way. Now on to our introduction of the speakers. Today's moderator, Ms. Elizabeth Evitz Dickinson, has written about architecture and design in cities and for culture for more than two decades. With her feature articles and essays published, published in places like the New Yorker, the New York Times, and the Washington Post Magazine and Fast Company Magazine, among others. Elizabeth has been contributing editor with Architect Magazine and has taught graduate level writing at MICA and Johns Hopkins University. In 2011, the Baltimore Architecture Foundation recognized her contribution to the field of architecture with the Roger D. Redden Award. Elizabeth, turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarsfield, for that introduction. And thank you, Dr. Brown, for an exceptional presentation, as always. <laughs> I had the great pleasure of talking with Dr. Brown several years ago at Morgan State, where we had a robust and wide ranging conversation about racial covenants used in the planning of Roland Park here in Baltimore. And Dr. Brown, I wanna thank you again for your research, your candor, and of course, for this exceptional book that you've put into the world. Um, we have with us today three excellent discussants who are going to engage Dr. Brown with questions based on his research and his book. If you have questions for Dr. Brown or for our discussants as we move through their questions, um, please put those into the q and I'm keeping track of all of them and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the last few minutes of our panel. And um, in an effort to leave plenty of time for what I know will be a robust discussion, I'm just gonna give you a very quick introduction of our three discussants. And then I'm gonna post some additional biographical information about each of them in the chat. So they will each have a quick back and forth with Dr. Brown and at the end, we'll get to some of your questions. First step, with a qu uh, questions around planning. Seema Eyer is Associate Director of the Jacob France Institute in the University of Baltimore's Merrick School of Business. Seema? Thanks so much for the invitation to be here. And as always, Dr. Brown, I think we could all listen to you speak um, for a very long time. So fantastic pre presentation and uh, congratulations to you on the book as well. Um, I could ask a billion questions. Uh, I do want to maybe kind of attack the very last thing that you mentioned, that to think the problems were created with radical problems um, and you need radical solutions. The problems, as you so well identify, are also systemic, right? It wasn't just one thing, right, that you clearly lay out. It's everything, every system slowly and methodically um, leads to this kind of uh, segregation. And so the problems were radical and so the solutions have to be radical, but the problems were systemic and the solutions also have to be systemic, which is what you lay out in your social impact bond. Um, for those of us that are planners and architects, um, we don't tend to work systemically, right? We tend to be, um, you know, the bat baton gets passed in the built environment, right? The, the, the sewer systems are created and then the development happens and then you know, the architects come in to build. Um, we work with in serial nature often, we don't work systemically. And so we also have to kind of radically change 
our own systems and the way we work. And I do appreciate the fact that you talk about the built environment in its entirety, um, because where we build buildings is based on where we've invested the capital infrastructure <laughs> to build those buildings to begin with. The, the roads, the sewers, the water system, as we know in Flint that has been degraded. Um, so I just wanna think about um, how can we actually start working systemically so those kinds of investments can continue to happen in, in African-American neighborhoods. And thanks again. Absolutely, thank you for that. And, you know, I think your observation about how this is systemic in track six, I believe in my book, um, I believe it's entitled Make Black Neighborhoods Matter. What I try to do is walk through system by system, many of the systems that I mentioned here, to say, here's what Baltimore uh, City Health Department needs to do. Here's what the Department of Housing and Community Development needs to do. Here's what the Baltimore City Public School System needs to do. So I, I, walk, I take a walk through system by system to try to get at exactly what you just laid out there so that it's not just things we need to do at the city level at, in, a, in a large way, but in these actual agencies and departments within the city, the Office of Equity and Civil Rights, <laughs> I cannot leave them out. These are the departments that help create urban apartheid in Baltimore. Therefore, they have to be about the business of dismantling that apartheid and making black neighborhoods matter. Excellent. Next up, talking about questions of preservation, we have Tom Liebel. And Tom is a vice president at Mosley Architects, and he is chair of the Baltimore City for Historical and Architectural Preservation, otherwise known as CHAP. Thank you very much. And what an astounding, uh, compelling presentation we've had here today. Um, a couple of questions kind of put us in context of, of the preservation movement. Um, over the last couple of decades, historic preservation has gotten better at acknowledging the diverse and complex social history of this country and no longer focuses solely on iconic works of high style architecture. Because of this evolution of thought, uh, agencies like CHAP have identified a broader spectrum of communities as historic districts. However, when analyzing which neighborhoods take advantage of the CHAP Historic Preservation Tax Credit, they are substantially comprised of neighborhoods in the White L. What are the things that CHAP can do to ensure that back, black butterfly neighborhoods are able to receive the same tax advantages as white L neighborhoods? And taking this a bit further, can you address what appears to be a duality of gentrification versus disinvestment? It seems to be a false choice that the only options are either neighborhood improvements followed by gentrification and displacement or the maintenance, uh, maintaining of an unacceptable status quo. We have to find a way to improve our most distressed neighborhoods. Uh, without the associated gentrification? Thank you for those questions. I'll start with the first. Um, you know, as far as the historic tax credit, um, I think, first of all, we got to identify and understand that Black neighborhoods are ought to be preserved. Even in a racially segregated society, the idea is not to just come in and, and gentrify and demolish and bulldoze Black neighborhoods. We, we tried that already and it didn't work. So what we need to do if we're gonna actually make the tax code equitable um, is recognize that many of these communities have their own rich history. And then the tax code, actually what I would do is the white elk neighborhoods should be paying more taxes so that black neighborhoods can be restored. You gotta make, instead of a, having a regressive tax system, and it's one where people have to apply for certain tax credits. I think that's an issue with process equity. The process is one that you gotta go and fill out this and fill out that and submit this and submit that. Get rid of that, make it automatic. Why not just say, look, red line, black neighborhoods, look at the map. Just look at the red communities. We're gonna, we're gonna red communities pay little to no taxes. Yellow communities pay a little bit more. Blue communities, you're gonna have to pay up. And green communities, you show enough should be paying more tax. So that makes the tax system progressive as opposed to regressive. Now to the second question. I would say, great question again, because now what black neighborhoods need 
is development without displacement. That's, that's, the, that's the third option. It shouldn't be no development, no capital, or when capital comes, it pushes black people out. It should be the third option, development without displacement. Right now we have a live near your work tax credit or a program, grant program. It gives people who often don't live in the city a grant that they, if they live here long enough becomes a grant that allows them to buy property in Baltimore City. So if we got a live near your work grant, why don't we have a stay where you are grant? And the stay where you are grant should be just as much as the live near your work grant. So if Hopkins can give 36,000 for Hopkins employee to move into the city and buy a property, then the stay where you are 40,000 so that the black homeowner can keep their property, fix it up and enjoy the benefits of a retail. So development without this place is a third option. We've never tried it, but we need to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. So moving on to talk about um, architecture, historic preservation and practice. We have Nikita Reed, AIA, who is an award-winning architect with Quinn Evans. Nikita? Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Brown, for this talk. It was amazing. And I was very grateful to be able to come down and get uh, my copy autographed. So if you haven't picked up a copy, I highly recommend it to everyone in the audience. And so um, my question today is going to pivot a little bit from just architecture and preservation, because um, a lot of what you talked about was really the wealth that was pilfered from the Black communities. And so just for context for everyone who's on the call. Um, so I'm going to read two to two quotes from the book and then get to the question. Uh, so on one of the pages, you state that poverty in black neighborhoods is not a function of residents' personal attributes, nor their lack of hard work, nor their inability to financially manage money. Poverty is the result of intentional and ill-formed government corporate and philanthropic policies and practices that block sustainable public and private allocations of resources to redline black neighborhoods, which result in their severe economic underdevelopment. And then you further go on to state that restoration ultimately means returning the wealth that was pilfered from black communities so that the people in the, in the neighborhoods impacted by historical trauma can decide how they want to allocate the funds to rebuild and repair their neighborhoods. So my question is, could you talk more about the need to trust communities, particularly redline black ones, to have the autonomy to do what they see best with the funds that would be returned to the community instead of putting roadblocks in the way to control where the funds are spent? Absolutely. Um, yeah, powerful question. And I think you, you lead me to, even though I use the word equity a lot in my book, and I define it <laughs> very particularly, most of the ways that I hear people using equity, I'm actually sick and tired of. I'm, I'm tired of equity in the public discourse. Well, Dr. Brown, why would you say that? Because it's not clear. It's not, uh, it's not sharp enough to deal with the radical problems which require radical solutions. So for me, the way I answer your question is to say we need to move beyond equity. We need to move to what Dr. W.B. Du Bois in his book Black Reconstruction called abolition democracy. To me, abolition democracy is very clear because what it says is slavery was only negatively abolished in America. We got rid of chattel slavery, but we didn't go about the business of comprehensively bringing black people and addressing that domination of space that I talked about. We haven't gone about the business of building institutions and systems that incorporate and include black people as full citizens in this society. And to me, that's what we have to do. Democracy, abolition democracy means that we are giving people voice, that they get a say in how the society operates and how their community gets redeveloped. So to me, that's, that, in my next book, <laughs> in my next book, I would love if they give me the opportunity, it's going to be something about establishing the, the abolition democracy. That's it. We got to, Sadia Hartman calls it the afterlife of slavery. Slavery is not dead. It's just changed forms and mutated, and that domination of space continues. So that legacy of slavery, which is the domination of space from the plantation to the red line communities that we have today, is still with us. 
So we need abolition democracy to finally abolish slavery completely once and for all and make black neighborhoods matter and allow black residents to have the funding and the resources they need to rebuild their communities. Thanks. Well, I think I speak for everyone when I say we are very much looking forward to your next book and where it takes us. Um, no pressure, just, just you know. <laughs> um, so we have um, several questions from the audience and some of them sort of fall under similar categories. So the first one sort of falls under when you were talking about displacement. And so I open this up to Dr. Brown, but I also open this up to any of our discussants who have insights on this as well. Some of the questions really related to when, you know, when Borough and others started uprooting Black neighborhoods historically here, where were people uprooted to and what was built in their place? In other words, when we're, and now that we're demolitioning public housing, where are people being put? Historically and now? Oh, great question. Historically, honestly, I'm not quite sure. I don't think they were put somewhere. I think they were left on their own. So you had to go find, and what, we'll see what happened is that if you go back to the redlining map, it shows, and I say redlining, but keep remembering there were four linings, red lining, yellow lining, blue lining, and green lining. R yellow line and red line deprive people of capital, blue line and green lines advantage communities with capital. So we gotta remember those four colors. But the red colored communities, that's where African-Americans live. So black people were concentrated. Remember public housing was put into those communities. And then it's those same communities that need renewal. Of course it needs renewal, they've been redlined. So they're gonna need, they're gonna fall into disrepair. So my thinking is that people just had to find, they had to double up, triple up because the housing stock and the walls of segregation, the doors that were closed, we're talking about doors open, the doors were closed. So they couldn't go out to the white community so that means people had to bu buckle up and triple up and the concentration, the density of poverty increased. That would be my supposition about what happened then. And then today, you know, we have vouchers, housing choice vouchers. And when the public housing is demolished, many people are giving those vouchers and they don't end up in the white L. They either end up, maybe if they have a special voucher from the Thompson versus HUD court decree that allows them to move to the surrounding counties or they end up with the regular voucher in the black butterfly in Baltimore city. So even the voucher program helps to maintain racial segregation. It's just like urban renewal did. So a lot of our solutions actually deepen the problem. And so I think that's why this repeated uprooting of black neighborhoods is so destructive it never brings resources to black neighborhoods and then it disperses black people uh, in ways that are also harmful. So I think that's why development without displacement. And I, I'm, I'm gonna go right at it. Reparations, need black neighborhood reparations. I talk about this in my book. And the reason why, remember radical problems require radical solutions. Reparations is not giving black people anything. Money was stolen from black communities. Black people were stolen from Africa. Black people were shipped down to New Orleans from the harbor. Black neighborhoods were redlined, subprime, marginalized, and demonized. Wealth was extracted. All reparations is, is giving these neighborhoods the money back that was taken. It's not a handout, it's restoration. It's making sure that the labor that was rendered is now able to be fully compensated and the lives in those communities are able to fully matter. Well, you just hit on another question that's been coming up, which is, do you have thoughts on, you know, how we go about reparations, how we go about relieving this historically inertiaed, um, tr like conversation? Yes, and in my book, I write about that we shouldn't just look at the federal government. I showed you the newspaper evidence of how Baltimore City created racial zoning, residential racial zoning. Baltimore City was the pioneer. Baltimore City 
and developers help to create race or enforce community-wide racially restrictive covenant. Well, you know about that because you interviewed Paige Glosser who wrote about Roland Park Company, right? And the Roland Park Company and the Forest Park Company, they pioneer community-wide racially restrictive covenants. So Baltimore is at the forefront of creating weapons of racial segregation, which deprive black neighbors of capital. So don't just look at the federal government, the city of Baltimore owes a debt to black neighborhoods. How do we do it? I say take 10% of our budget, which a few years ago was around $3 billion. So 3 billion, 10% of 3 billion is 300 million. And for the next 40, 50 plus years, take that 10% and allocate it between the top 15 to 20 red line black neighborhoods. And then let a democratically elected council of people administer and help decide in combination with the community how that money needs to be allocated. And then you need to have technical assistance, involve our HBCUs and help those communities decide and then build, hello architects, designers, planners, we need you to serve as technical assistance. We need you to help design the Wakandas. We need you to be involved in pushing for this first of all, and then being a part of rendering service to help rebuild these communities. That's the plan that I put forth in my book. So it's interesting because we're getting two um, distinct questions. One about that idea of how you successfully rebuild historically ignored black neighborhoods. And so I'm gonna ask this one first, which is a couple people have been asking about, you know, what's the reality of thinking through um, funding and design and development when the systems are, are so hard to, to move? How do you, I guess people are saying, how do we start now? How do we get going as we're trying to do this larger uh, systematic change that you're discussing? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, going to, it's going to take advocacy. It's going to take organizing. If you go back to the articles I showed you and you read my book, white segregationists, they organized, they lobbied the mayor for segregation. Church, white churches, white realtors, white, white moms and dads, homeowners, they lobbied the, the city government to make racial segregation a reality. Now, here's my thing. The same energy that went into creating the system, you got to match that energy to dismantle it. So if they organize, guess what we got to do? We got to organize. If neighborhood associations, white churches, white realtors, white architects, white planners, white designers help create it, you got to be the one to help go and tear this thing apart piece by piece with the same energy that went into creating it. That's the energy you're going to have to take to make abolition democracy a reality. It Sina? took a lot of energy and a lot of work, so that's what it's going to take. Did you want to jump in, Sima? Oh, absolutely. Um, you, Dr. Brown is absolutely right. And I think for those of us in Baltimore, we can look right now at examples in the city of Baltimore that have uh, were in those redlined areas. They were not predominantly Black at the time. But today, they're actually some of our wealthiest neighborhoods. So Canton. If you look really closely at those red line neighborhoods, Canton and Locust Point were both in the red areas. And today they are among our wealthiest, uh, most kind of uh, sought after neighborhoods and predominantly white still. Um, and so if we wanna take a look at what Dr. Brown is saying, we have done it. <laughs> We've done it. We've taken red line neighborhoods over 40 years of investment in Canton and Locust Point slowly, right? We slowly rebuilt roads. We slowly connected them to I-95. We did the American Can Company, which is actually EDA funding, another federal agency. And then we did the private sector. And then we did you know, the home ownership and we built and designed. And now we're doing Broadway markets in, in, um, in, that, in that area. And slowly over time, we have layered over 40 years where now Canton and Locust Point are our number one highest income neighborhood, and they were in the red line. So we have done it. We have done it. But it is a 40 year endeavor, slowly, uh, but radically, you know, a big road construction is a lot of money. 
Um, so we can do this and we have evidence that we can do it. And we can, we do not need to have in our city neighborhoods that um, you know, are so disinvested in. It doesn't have to be like this. We can see that it doesn't have to be like this and taking Dr. Brown's approach is exactly the right answer. Well, this leads us to another question that's come up from a few folks, which is, I know not everybody um, could necessarily afford rents in some of these places, right? Or, or home prices. And so one of the questions is, is it possible to have new development in low income neighborhoods without that raising of the price of living, those prices that may drive out um, low income inhabitants because of affordability? Of course, it's always that tricky balance of, you know, how do you start to make these improvements, but keep it so that the folks who are living there benefit as yeah, well. I mean, I think we have to be creative and I think we have to, you know, do things like freeze legacy residence taxes, you know, so that, yeah, as the home values go up, their taxes remain the same, you know, vouchers for when that new whole food comes in, you know, and they should be there to enjoy and, and the subsidy to afford that new whole foods. So I think, there are things that we can do if we're creative, you know, the stay where you are voucher that I talked about earlier. If you got the live near your work voucher to help move people in, you need to stay where you are voucher to keep legacy residents where they are. So I think there are solutions. That's the thing I saw in the chat, somebody talked about imagining. One problem with white supremacy in America is that it forecloses our imagination. We can't, most of us can't even imagine thriving black communities. Our imaginations, our narrative, remember that dominant narrative I talked about with the Baltimore Sun? That dominant narrative closes off our imagination. Which means what we have to do, part of what we have to do is renovate K through 12 education. Because child, children that go to school in Baltimore, there should be a curriculum that empowers the babies and the youth in this city to understand urban planning, to understand that history that I laid out, and then to imagine with funding how they can make their neighborhood matter. That's the process. The children are the ones that will lead us to the promised land, but they can't do that if we give them a raggedy education that doesn't unleash their imagination, that helps them to create the solutions to help Baltimore City thrive. You bring up imagination and, and it's interesting because there are a couple of folks who ask questions on this idea of can we also imagine vibrant integrated neighborhoods that on your category five map, most of it was you know segregated, but there were a few spots of integration and there are questions about like what has contributed to the success of mixed communities and multiracial communities and um, can we talk about what it looks like to actually have vibrant, integrated neighborhoods in our cities again? Yeah, and I don't know the full answer to that, um, but you're right that we do have like, you know, Lauraville, other portions of Northeast Baltimore, uh, further north going towards the county in the city that are more integrated. And so I think, um, can it be done? Yes, it can be done. But I would just encourage people to think that desegregation is not just white and black people moving close to each other. Real desegregation is black people living wherever they are and having resources where they are. Desegregate the budget, desegregate resources, desegregate bank lending, desegregate those maps of capital allocation. That is real desegregation because if you allocate resources, I don't like that word invest, because that ROI capitalist thinking. If you allocate resources to black neighborhoods, guess what? Everybody's gonna wanna live there. So you're gonna create integration with proper allocation. And that's the way that we have to be thinking, not just, hey, we all gonna live together. That's the only way. That's not the only way. It's one way, but it's not the only way. Well, our time is almost up. It's almost 2.30 and being sensitive to time. I want to say we have a few questions that we didn't get to answer, but I will say a lot of your questions are answered in Dr. Brown's book. Um, so I highly encourage those of you who have not picked it up and read it to do so. And I know that on his website and elsewhere online, we can continue to engage in these conversations. Um, I'm going to pass it back over to um, 
the Baltimore Architecture Foundation, just to say again, I think in our chat, we have a link to where you can see this um, recorded. I'll make sure that that link gets posted again so that um, if you want to revisit this presentation, you can look at it anytime. Again, on behalf of the Baltimore Architectural Foundation and Baltimore Heritage, we'd like to thank everyone for participating in this profound opportunity to listen to our scholar, Dr. Lawrence Brown. Thank you so much.